Αξιότιμη κυρία Υπουργέ, αξιότιμοι συνάδελφοι και φίλοι, κυρίες και κύριοι. Είναι μεγάλη μου χαρά και τιμή να σας καλωσορίσω απόψε σε αυτή την μεγαλοπρεπή αίθουσα και να σας παρουσιάσω το έργο της Βρυτανικής Σχολής Αθηνών. Καταρχάς, θα ήθελα να εκφράσω εκ μέρους της σχολής τις θερμές μας ευχαριστίες στο Γενικό Γραμματέα της Εναθήνες Αρχαιολόγικης Εταιρείας, κ. Βασίλειο Πετράκο, και στο προσωπικό της εταιρείας για την φιλοξενία τους. Επίσης, ευχαριστώ θερμότατα το προσωπικό της Βρετανικής Σχολής και στην Ελλάδα και στην Αγγλία για την συμβολή τους στο έργο της σχολής το οποίο θα παρουσιάσω σήμερα. Distinguished colleagues, uh, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honour and pleasure to welcome you to the annual open meeting of the British School at Athens. I begin by expressing the school's gratitude to the Secretary General of the Archaeological Eteria, Dr. Vasilios Petrakos, and to his staff for hosting this event once more this evening in this magnificent venue. I also add my thanks as director to all the BSA staff, both here in Greece and in the UK, for everything they have contributed to the programme of work I summarised this evening. Before I begin my summary, I'd like to highlight the importance to the BSA of communication. It's essential within the organisation because the centre of gravity of our activities is in Greece, at our bases in Athens and Knossos, while we manage our UK operations in London. Equally important, if not more so, is external communication with all of our stakeholders worldwide, subscribers, members, friends, collaborators, and all those with an interest, professional, academic, or otherwise, uh, in the Hellenic world in all aspects and across all periods. That communication takes many forms, conventional, orally, as in this talk, or in print, as in our publications and our recently revived newsletter seen here. Equally and increasingly, it takes place digitally via social media, on Facebook and Twitter, both of which beam information out, or on the web, which requires readers to find and reach our pages. We also record as many of our events as possible for our BSA YouTube channel, allowing access to those unable to attend in person. Continuing that theme, the real value of our research comes with its dissemination to the wider public, both academic and general. Our journals and our monograph series represent the significant contribution the school makes to the distribution of the knowledge generated by the research we both carry out and facilitate. In addition to new issues of the Annual of the BSA and the Archaeological Reports and ongoing updates to Archaeology in Greece Online in collaboration with the French School at Athens, a further volume, Hellenomania, just appeared in our monograph series, British School at Athens, Modern Greek and Byzantine Studies. It joins Critomania, published last year. It is through enhanced communication that we are currently seeking to raise our profile in order to continue to enlarge our support base and to give us the opportunity to grow our already extensive activities. An example of a recent gener generous act of support is the anonymous donation which allowed us last summer to refurbish the exterior of the Upper House, a landmark building designed and built in 1886 by Francis Penrose, the first director of the BSA. It is now used, as many of you in this room will know, for most of our lectures, workshops and seminars, and also houses our artist studio. Legacy buildings like this one bring character to our Athens base, but their upkeep can be a challenge, and we are most grateful for the generous help received. Unfortunately, I can only present a selection of our work in 2017 this evening. This included events in the school and elsewhere on a range of topics, from conferences in September on the work and life of the late Cypriot author and artist Nikki Marangu, a workshop in memory of Professor Christopher Mee, a former assistant director of the BSA, who sadly died in 2014, as well as the annual Michael Freda Memorial Lecture in Ancient Philosophy, delivered by Tony Long of the University of California at Berkeley. Further workshops and lectures in collaboration with many institutions, including the Universities of Athens and Thessaloniki, Pandion University, 
the Academy of Athens, the National Hellenic Research Foundation, the Archaeological Society of Athens, the Athens School of Fine Arts, the National Archaeological and Thessaloniki Museums, the Benaki Museum, the Museum of Cycladic Art, including the annual lecture jointly sponsored by the BSA with the Institute of Classical Studies in London and the National Hellenic Research Foundation and delivered by Professor Angie Hobbs and also an event held in Thessaloniki to launch our recently published volume, Archaeology Behind the Battle Lines. And finally, a workshop in association with the Benaki Museum exhibition, Charmed Lives in Greece, about Gika, Craxton and Lee Fermer, which will open again at the British Museum on the 7th of March. Our activities span many times, places and disciplines. History, ancient, medieval and modern, art history, literature, philosophy, the fine arts, and anthropology. Our A.G. Livendis postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Irini Avramopoulou, continued her anthropological research into forced migration, and I'm very pleased to announce was recently appointed to a lectureship at Pandion University, which will she will take up later this year after completing her fellowship. In 2017, she was joined by an academic lawyer from University College London, Dr. Ralph Wilde, who spent three months at the BSA as our visiting fellow. Ralph investigates the forced migration crisis from the point of view of international law, using Greece as one case study within a five-year European uh, Council-funded uh, grant project, Human Rights Beyond Borders. Our 2017 arts bursary holder was Annabel Dover. Among her many activities, she engaged with the BSA's research theme building the archive by documenting not only the artifacts displayed in our small museum collection, but also the accidental artifacts left behind by those who catalogued the collection, such as an airmail envelope with notes. For some of these, she created her own watercolour paints using plant-based pigments from the BSA garden and mica ground from a stone she had found here in Athens. Before summarising our fieldwork in 2017, I begin by expressing the school's gratitude to the staff of the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Sports. We are most grateful to Dr. Maria Andreadaki Vlazaki, Secretary General of the Ministry, and to Dr. Eleni Korka, the Director General of Antiquities, as well as to the numerous colleagues in the Ministry who make our archaeological work possible. In particular, we thank those in charge of the regions in which our major fieldwork took place. Dr. Dimitris Athanasoulis of the Effort of Antiquities of the Cyclades, Dr. Alexandra Harami of the Effort of Antiquities of Boeotia, Dr. Stella Krisoulaki, the Effort of Antiquities of Western Attica, Perias, and the Islands, Dr. Paraskevi Kalamara, Effort of Antiquities of Evia, Mr. Ioannis Kanonidis, Effort of Antiquities of Chalkidiki and Mount Athos, Dr. Ephthemia Karantzali, Effort of Antiquities of Theotis and Evritania, Drs. Konstantinas Kisas and Panayota Kasimi of the Effort of Antiquities of Corinthia, Mrs. Evangelia Pandu, Effort of Antiquities of Laconia, Dr. Alkistis Papadimitriou, Effort of Antiquities of the Argolid, Mrs. Chrysa Sofianou, Effort of Antiquities of Lasithi, and Dr. Vasiliki Sithiakaki, Effort of Antiquities of Iraklio. I begin our survey in Crete with our Knossos Research Centre. Here, Kostis Christakis, our Knossos curator, has in his first 18 months transformed the facilities through a program of repair and refurbish refurbishment of the taverna and its gardens, assisted by Zacharias Pekinakis. Our curation project to document digitally the extensive collections in the Stratigraphical Museum also continues with two, two new personnel, shown here on the right, Danai Langa and Eleni Makrigorgu. Kostis has also raised the BSA's profile positively in the Iraklian region by initiating the Knossos Research Center Summer Lecture Series. Dr. Maria Blazaki inaugurated the series, speaking on the recently excavated ritual sacrifice in the Lake Manon 3B center of Kidonia, modern Hanya, and the second lecture on settlement patterns in Crete in the 7th and 9th centuries AD was given by Dr. Vasosithiakaki and archaeologist Maria Marie. Costis also organized an event of music, poetry, and drama dedicated to Nikos Kazantzakis' connections with Knossos in collaboration with the Knossos Cultural Association. Knossos was also the location for one of three field projects in 2017 that sought to develop our understanding of substantial cities. Our team completed 
a third season of geophysics there, with the overall goal of providing a spatial framework into which excavated material from Roman Knossos can be situated. The major aim was to deploy ground penetrating radar, GPR, in areas which had already revealed promising results in order to assess its value as a technique at Knossos. The team experimented in a variety of different conditions, paved and unpaved car parks and roads, olive groves and building interiors. Although GPR has great potential, it is more time consuming than other techniques. The team therefore covered a much smaller area than in previous seasons, but produced some promising preliminary, preliminary results. Subsurface features, some at differing depths, were detected in those areas marked with yellow boxes on the map. Although processing remains to be completed, the results revealed by GPR at more shallow depths, 1 to 1.5 metres, should correspond with the uppermost levels of the Roman city, and also the results of magnetometry already carried out. Remains revealed below 1.5 metres in depth may well be pre-Roman, suggesting that, with a degree of caution, GPR may allow access to elements of the pre-Roman city. Kithra, of course, lies only a few tens of kilometres north of western Crete. Here, the Kithra Island project, which I'll now refer to as KIP, co-directed by Cyprian Broodbank and Vangelio Kiriadzi, conducted diachronic intensive field survey over a 100 square kilometre area of the central southern part of the island from 1998 to 2001. At that time, a 2.5 square kilometre portion of this region, shown in black here, ringed with red, around the inland urban centre of ancient Kithra, now known as Paliokastro, was not available for investigation. Excavations by Ioannis Petrokilos documented the existence of a town there from at least the later geometric to until the early Roman period, and a major Acropolis sanctuary, epigraphically att uh, attributed to Athena, dating from the 8th century to the Hellenistic times. In 2017, the opportunity arose to reinforce and extend our understanding of the Paleocastro through intensive field walking, geophysics, and unmanned aerial vehicle or drone survey. The project's main objectives were to investigate the entirety of the Paleocastro urban zone to refine our understanding of the main timelines of human activity, to characterize better the changing spatial, to characterize better the changing spatial footprint of these activities, and to situate this key area more systematically within wider island and regional research agendas set by KIP, the Antikythera Survey Project, and excavations by Petroculos and others. Surface survey covered two square kilometres, and team members counted over, over 26,000 pot sherds and over 21,000 tiles, collecting 2,800 feature sherds and over 200 other finds. Preliminary results afford an initial picture of the history of this small but significant part of Kithra. Diagnostic final Neolithic to early Bronze I material comes mostly from the top of the hill, indicated in purple. But definite material of early Bronze II to Minoan is strikingly absent there, suggesting that it was neither used as a peak sanctuary, similar to nearby Ayos Yorios, nor as a habitation. This apparent gap of, two millennia, of up to two millennia on the hilltop also contrasts with lower areas in the valleys on all sides, which produce many small early bronze II to second palace scatters, probably farmsteads, including at least three new examples in 2017. Paleocastro follows a wider pattern, particularly clear on Crete and the Cyclades, of the appearance of very late, late Bronze Age refuge sites following abandonment or decline of lowland centres and likely seaborne raiding. There is probable continuity of slow settlement growth from perhaps 1200 to 1000 BC, shown in orange here, through the geometric and archaic periods, shown in green, when settlement was strongly nucleated on the Peleocastro, as seen on the right. The expansion and growth during the classical and Hellenistic, uh, and, sorry, the expansion and growth during the classical Hellenistic and stability or decline afterwards until as late as 50 to 100 AD. The earlier pottery associated with this scenario includes the second, continues the second and third palace potting traditions, but at some point within the archaic period, a new tradition emerged, marking the abandonment of micaceous pottery production. Pottery, including pitharia and large and small plain vessels, were made with neogene clays, most potentially 
uh, at workshops near Paleocastra. Historical sources document Kithra's importance and refer to the city's walls. Um, exploration in 2017 suggests it is possible that the southern area, clearly part of the city in the classical Hellenistic and Roman times, lay outside the archaic settlement proper, given the presence of 7th century BC burials, which one might expect to be an extramural. At some point during the classical period, there is a possible reinforcing of the northwestern part of the hill. Here, and on the far southeast side of the town, the fortifications are well preserved, and our drone survey enabled the team to create photogrammetric images of areas inaccessible to field walkers. The drone used was a donation made by a BSA friend, Richard Hayhoe, demonstrating how such generosity can contribute directly to our research. Different areas of the classical town exhibit a different character, different character in their surface assemblages. The main changes are the increased evidence for investment in higher status buildings on the lower southern slopes of the hill, indicated by the red box in the bottom left here, evidenced by finds of Rosso Antico, Perian marble, pebble mosaic floors, and fine ware pottery, mostly of Hellenistic to early Roman date, as well as very reduced evidence for settlement on the top ridge running southeast from the Athena temple on the Acropolis. Geophysical data already confirm and develop previous suggestions by Petrokolos, Tsaravopoulos, and others of an area of large public buildings very close to the surface on the southern side of the hill. Gradiometer survey in area four detected the lines of a substantial rectangular building or enclosure at least 30 by 15 meters. On another large terrace, uh, area six, a, a series of clear positive linear anomalies of substantial thickness was detected that seemed to represent rob robbed out wall footings. Wider comparative opportunities will emerge as the Paleocastro evidence is refined and juxtaposed both with previous KIP data and the results of the Andikithra survey. Already different patterns are emerging and the Paleocastro survey project offers an exciting, unusually detailed perspective on the Greek city. It can now also participate in an informative, wider regional dialogue. Moving to the opposite end of the Aegean, 2017 saw the fourth season of our collaborative project at the site of Olynthos, whose aim is to recover a uniquely detailed picture of Greek households as social and economic units within their broader neighbourhood, urban and regional settings. On the North Hill, the team continued to investigate House B96, working towards its complete excavation by the end of the 2018 season, and to explore settlement organisation and the distribution of activities across the hill. Continued excavation of House B96 showed that its poorly preserved southeastern corner had two occupation phases, the later consisting of a cobbled floor surface close to the eastern boundary wall with a pebble and gravel floor or, or subfloor matrix. Beneath lay a destruction deposit characterised by tiles lying flat. The central section of the Pastas and its boundary with the courtyard were revealed, including two cut stone bases on which wooden columns or posts probably rested to support the roof. One of these may have been incorporated into a north-south wall which appears to have divided the Pastas. On the South Hill, further electrical resistance survey suggested that the urban grid identified in 2016 continued across almost the whole of the surveyable part of the hill with the exception of its extreme south. Further survey of a limited portion of the southern part of the hill with ground penetrating radar suggests that in that area at least, anomalies apparently representing road surfaces can be detected in the earliest cultural, cultural levels at a possible depth of up to 1.5 metres. Magnetic and electromagnetic survey outside the fenced archaeological site to the east of the South Hill suggested that settlement here was much less dense than on the two hills and does not appear to follow the kind of grid envisaged by Robinson. Three new 4x4 trenches on the South Hill began to reveal the level of preservation and some of the techniques used for the construction of roads and buildings in this district. The excellent state of preservation of some of the material belonging to the final phase of occupation is attested by a rich destruction horizon overlying a cobbled street where many artefacts had fallen, perhaps due to the collapse of an upper story or of a timber structure um, of a timber structure built against the facade of the neighbouring buildings, whose traces were located in the form of a series of four post holes. In addition to ceramics and a few metal finds, material from this area also included quantities of animal bone. In the hinterland, 
Field walkers covered an area of 1.19 square kilometres in 2017. Collection focused on the area to the north of the North Hill. Field survey around the city revealed an area of dense occupation to the east of the South Hill, a limited area southeast of the South Hill, yielding high concentrations of material comprising late Roman and Byzantine, as well as the usual classical pottery. The northern edge of the study area showed more limited and less dense evidence. Magnetometry survey west of the northern part of the North Hill, where field walking in 2016 had yielded ceramic debris and a human tooth, located a group of small, strong anomalies, apparently representing graves, suggesting that this area lies beyond the boundary of the ancient city. Preliminary study of the ceramics from both the North and South Hills suggests that the majority of the fine pottery, black slipped and red figure wares, was manufactured in the Chalkidiki, although attic imports are also present. The majority of the ceramics found on both hills to dates to the first half, often the second quarter of the fourth century BC. No vessels on current ceramic chronologies seem to post-date the supposed destruction date of the city in, six, in 348 BC. A first multi-authored publication of the project's research results recently appeared in the 2017 Annual of the British School at Athens. We now move both further south in space to Thessaly and further back in time to the Middle Neolithic and at the site of, ne of Kutralu Magula. This image shows a series of interactive uh, sculptures produced in 2017 by Jaju Ma, an artist with the Rhode Island School of Art and Design, inspired by Kutralu Magula's figurines, a prominent component of the finds there. In 2017, this collaborative project not only continued excavation on top of the hill, to the left here, but also extended investigations to the slope and the surrounding ditches revealed by earlier geophysical survey. Trench C15 on the eastern slope revealed rich and extensive activity, including complete ceramic vessels, quite rare on the site, a concentration of quern stones and a possible hearth. Excavation in trench He 16 confirmed the existence of a ditch, although its exact depth and width are still to be determined. There was also evidence of maintenance of the ditch in the form of a recut. Trench C21, however, open to investigate a large rectangular geophysical signature in the southeastern corner of the tell revealed no signs of any structure. Okay. In 2017, the BSA returned to Boeotia, an area in which we had worked early in the 20th century at Rizzona and Aliartos, and in the late 1970s and 80s with the Cambridge, Bradford, Boeotia Archaeological and Geographical Expedition, or Cabbage, from much shorter. This year we commenced the first season of a five-year collaborative project to explore the Mycenaean Chamber Tomb Cemetery at Prosilio on the slopes of Mount Acondion near Orchomenos. Research in 2017 focused on the excavation of Tomb 2, a monumental Mycenaean chamber tomb constructed in the middle of the 14th century BC first identified and partially explored in 2014. The tomb is one of the largest of its kind discovered in Greece. A 20 meter long keyhole shaped passageway of Romos leads to a monumental facade 5.4 meters in height shown on the right here. The facade gives access through a doorway, Stomion, to a rectangular burial chamber shown on the left, 42 meters square in area, the ninth largest of around 4,000 Mycenaean chamber tombs excavated in Greece over the past 150 years. A rock-cut bench, enhanced by the addition of mud plaster, was carved on all four sides of the chamber. The chamber's roof, originally gabled with a height of around 3.5 metres, appears to have started to crumble already in Mycenaean times, perhaps because of the construction of the dromos of another chamber tomb nearby. This rockfall disturbed the burial and furnishings, but also helped to seal the burial layer. Cultural deposits only begin to appear in the lowest 15 to 20 centimetres of a deposit in the chamber, suggesting that no further burials took place after this roof collapse. Micromorphological analysis indicates that the tomb was re-entered in the Mycenaean period, perhaps to prepare the ground for a new burial or as part of a ritual, and those responsible deemed the tomb unsafe for further burials and abandoned its use. Burials by this group may have continued in another nearby chamber tomb yet to be investigated. 
The roof collapse probably prevented looting when robbers at some point before the Hellenistic and Roman period entered through the upper part of the sealed stomion. Such a scenario would explain why, on the chamber floor, the team discovered only the burial of a single male individual, 40 to 50 years old, accompanied by a number of objects. These include tinned clay vessels of various shapes, a pair of bronze horse bits, bronze arrows and bronze pins, bronze elements possibly from a bow, jewellery of various types and materials including gold, glass and faience, bone combs, an agate seal stone and a gold signet ring. The presence of a single burial with important finds is unusual. Tombs of this type are normally used for many burials, making it difficult to associate particular objects with individual burials, while their prominence make them, made them targets for looting from antiquity to the present. Tomb 2 is probably associated with ancient Orchomenos, marked on the far right with the red arrow, which is 3.5 kilometres distant, and which of course supervised and controlled the partial drainage of the Lake Copais in the 14th and 13th centuries BC. The tomb's date is thus important, filling a relatively little known period at Orchomenos, whose later 13th century BC remains, such as the famous Tholos tomb shown here below, are extensive. Discovery of this burial and its associated finds will help us to understand better funeral practices in the region in the Mycenaean period. First examination suggests a conscious selection of the objects interred with the body by the tomb using group responsible for the burial's preparation. The placement of different forms and types of jewellery with a male burial contests the still common belief that jewellery is mostly associated with female burials. With the exception of two painted stirrup jars, one of them shown here, perhaps associated with the attempt to re-enter the tomb within the Mycenaean period, no painted pottery was discovered in the tomb, a feature otherwise widely attested in tombs of this period. The high-resolution data collected in 2017 will help us further clarify the position of Orchomenos in the region and start anew the debate concerning the role of death and the rituals associated with it in Mycenaean life during the palatial period. A better understanding of the extent and density of the Prosilio Cemetery should emerge once the results of geophysical study carried out in late November, early December 2017 are available. At this point, I merely mentioned the Keros Naxos Seaways project to, to whet your appetite for the following lecture. Both Prosilio and Keros das Galio captured the public imagination, as is demonstrated by press coverage within the Greece and beyond, including in the Times and the Guardian, as well as press, re press releases from the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Sports. Based in Athens, but with a broad reach reflected in the dots on this map, the Fitch Laboratory remains, after 30 years, at the forefront of archaeological ceramic research worldwide because it employs a holistic approach to the study of ancient pottery, combining an understanding of the materials and techniques used in ancient technology with an appreciation of the social context and environment within which potters and consumers acted, as exemplified by replication experiments and experimental archaeology, both in open-air conditions and in the laboratory. Scientific techniques include the combined use of petrography and chemical analysis conducted in-house. Mobility, much in the news in the modern world, is also a hot topic in science-based archaeology, where technological transfer over time and across space is being used as a means to understand better human mobility at various scales and intensity. The Fitch was therefore the ideal location for Bartek Lys, shown here, to take up an EU-funded Marie Sklodowska Curie International Exchange Fellowship for a project entitled Travelling Ceramic Technologies as Markers of Human Mobility in the Aegean, or TRAPT for short. A highlight of the Fitch's 2016-17 year was the annual Mark and Ismini Fitch Laboratory Lecture presented by Dr. Richard Jones. An opportunity to celebrate not only the 30th anniversary of the publication of Greek and Cypriot Pottery, a review of scientific studies, a milestone for research in the field of ceramic analysis in the Aegean and beyond, but also to celebrate Richard himself, first director of the Fitch Laboratory and an eminent scholar in the field of archaeological science who recently retired from his post in Glasgow. He's shown here, in, uh, following his lecture, talking to Charles Williams II, a long-term benefactor who has helped to ensure that the laboratory maintains its position as a leading centre in the field. His support is also reflected in our postdoctoral Williams Fellow 
Fellowship in Ceramic Petrology, from which Dr. John Gape recently stepped down. John is succeeded by Dr. Florence Liard. The laboratory also hosted several visiting researchers at various academic career stages, including Effie Nikita, then a Mary Shlodowska Curie postdoctoral fellow at Sheffield, now an assistant professor at the Cyprus Institute, who carried out a systematic examination of a large quantity of human remains from cemeteries in Boeotia to identify temporal and spatial patterns to complement written sources and material culture. A former school student, Effie's textbook, Osteoarchaeology, was published by Elsevier in 2017. Four Fitch bursary holders carried out research at the Fitch in 2016-17. Anti-clockwise, from top left, they were Carlotta Gardner, from a PhD student at the University College London, who worked on metalworking ceramics in Roman Britain, yes, Roman Britain, by testing, by testing custom-made experimental ceramics, she provided invaluable insights into an assessment of metalworkers' technological choices. Former UCL University College London MSc student Yanis Papadias, now a PhD student at the Aristotle University in Thessaloniki, examined through petrographic and elemental analysis ceramic samples from coastal and inland sites in, in central Macedonia, exploring patterns of continuity or innovation in craft production during the transition from the Late Bronze to the Early Iron Age. Anna Naj, a PhD student at Ietvos Laurent University in Budapest, focused on the study of a range of transport amphorae excavated in southern Pannonia, combining macroscopic stylistic examination with petrographic in order to shed light on the economic connections of this Roman province. She made extensive use of the Fitch's reference collections of archaeological and geological samples from across the Aegean to identify the provenance of several types of Aegean amphorae recovered in her study region. Finally, with master's degrees from universities of both Crete and Sheffield, Nikki Papa Constantinou, also a PhD student at the Aristotle University, continued as a Fitch bursary holder her study of the extensive human skeletal remains from the late Bronze Age cemetery of Kolikrepi Sparta, a collaboration between the Fitch, the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, and the effort of antiquities of Eastern Attica. Last but not least, a number of undergraduate and master's students received hands-on training. No, no, no. Uh, last but not least, a number of undergraduate and master's students received hands-on training at the laboratory every year, assisting at various stages of research. In the context of our continuing collaboration with the Department of History and Archaeology at the Aristotle University under the ATLAS scheme, Konstantinos Arkadinos last year provided invaluable help to human osteology projects for over two months. I close with a brief mention of those we quaintly refer to in the BSA as students, that is, holders of our research awards. Dr. Matthew Skews, uh, formerly of Exeter, now at the University of Edinburgh, spent a second year as Macmillan Rodevolt student seeking to situate Egyptian and Egyptianizing objects, primarily from BSA excavations of Perahora, within their local context of deposition and within the social and political history of the early Iron Age and Archaic period in order to understand better their significance in the Greek world. Rebecca van Hover spent six months as Richard, from King's College London, spent six months as Richard Bradford McConnell student, completing a doctorate which concentrated on the notion of religious authority and examined how Attic orators assign it to different genres of evidence, including not only divine signs, such as oracles and dreams, but also oaths, the quotation of poetry, the concept of the laws, and the figure of the lawgiver. She shared that award with Lucy Lawrence of Sheffield, who used a newly developed method for dental microwear analysis to investigate what sheep and goats were fed and what the economic and social implications of these feeding techniques are, comparing archaeologically observed tooth abrasion to that on modern sheep and goat teeth with known and controlled diet. At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned communication. We like to think that the BSA has a broad reach, but I was surprised flattered and amused, in roughly equal measure, to receive in the post towards the end of last summer my Lego classicist's alter ego, produced by the son of someone in Australia with whom I'd been in correspondence. Flattering though it is, to me at least, the main point this demonstrates is about the networks of interest in and affection for organisations like the BSA. 
It therefore makes a small contribution to our goal of raising the BSA's visibility as we strive to meet the BSA's strategy ob object to promote the study of Greece in all its aspects, in all periods, including modern times. And with that, I conclude this year's report on the work of the British School of Athens. Thank you. Everybody stop.